You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to The Corbett Report Podcast. I'm your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, coming to you, as always, from the sunny climes of Western Japan, here on the 17th day of November 2017. This is episode 323 of the Corbett Report podcast. The Saudi purge is a global crisis. Now, as you may have guessed, we are taking a slight break from the follow-up episodes to the Why Big Oil Conquered the World documentary. Of course, last episode was on sustainable development. Future episodes will be on other aspects of that documentary that were not covered or not adequately covered within the documentary itself. But this week, we are taking a break from that in order to cover the ongoing, breaking, developing news story that is the Saudi Purge. And as the title of this episode states, this is not a local issue, this is not a regional issue, this is a global issue. And that is the picture I'm going to be attempting to paint in this episode of the podcast. But before we do that, I suppose it helps to know what is the Saudi Purge for those who may have been sleeping under a rock for the last couple of weeks. Let's just get a quick breakdown of what this actually is. So on November 4th, on the same day that a ballistic missile was intercepted on its way to Saudi Arabia from Yemen, and on the same day that Saad Hariri resigned as Lebanese prime minister in Saudi Arabia on Saudi TV, the Saudi crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, began an anti-corruption drive that swept up 11 princes, 11 of his cousins, and 500 officials and rich hangers-on, including 1,700 bank accounts, totaling $800 billion and a partridge in a pear tree. So as the dust clears on all of this, Mohammed bin Salman, a.k.a. MBS, is now in charge of all three Saudi security forces and is the single most powerful man in the country since the founding of the modern-day state by his grandfather, Ibn Saud. So that's a pretty crazy string of events, especially all taking place in a chaotic few days, as it did there on November 4th, 5th, 6th. But as crazy as all of that is, it's even crazier. As reflected by our conversation that we had earlier this week with Marwa Osman, a political commentator in Beirut. The resignation of Saad al-Hariri was... At, I remember very well because I was prepared to go out and my day was, was wrecked because I had to go to work, back to work. So it was a Saturday. It was about around 1 p.m. Beirut time. And we heard that. And just two hours later, breaking news about the arrest and the detention of 11 very important princes and more than 20 senior figures that were arrested by uh, Mohammed bin Salman on the orders of Mohammed bin Salman. And uh, uh, later on, an hour later, it was uh, broadcasted or it was announced that, um, of course, via Twitter, all of this is via Twitter because we cannot get anything from any media channel. So via Twitter, it was announced that the Ritz-Carlton is actually the new prison. And we knew that only because of the memo that was sent out by the Ritz-Carlton to the actual guests there, asking them politely to leave. So that there, well, there we go. It was, and, and the memo said that it was a matter of national security and an urgent matter by the government that we need you, we ask of you to leave. So we're talking about a five or maybe seven class star uh, hotel that is very, very luxurious that, that actually hosted the uh, uh, Donald Trump summit that happened um uh, I think it was two months or so ago, but it was midsummer. And uh, so it's, it's that. And it's the same hotel. We'll talk about that, too. It's the same hotel that Mohammed bin Salman had hosted the convention about uh, the technology. We all heard about Sophia, the robot who was given the, the, nation, the Saudi nationality. And we heard about the new city, the new uh, uh, intelligent city that bin Salman wants to build, which is Neom. That it was hosted just days before in that hotel, in the Ritz-Carlton. And we started linking the manner that bin Salman was able to arrest all of these princes at once, meaning that they were in the country altogether because of that convention. He did that convention 
to bring all the local and international and regional investors into the country to come watch what uh, what the new investments in Saudi Arabia for his 2030 plan is for this new Niyam um, uh, city, smart city, which, by the way, Al-Walid bin Talal refused to invest in, which is also a big question mark. Why would he refuse? So that happened two days later. Everybody goes back to the, the tourist cars, but as detainees, which is shocking. Now, what's shocking is not only having someone like Al-Walid bin Talal, whose net worth is more than $18 billion, being detained under the, the cases of corruption. And here we're talking about corruption of princes who already have everything are are you actually able to uh, um, like can you buy these men these might buy you we you can't buy them so that's also a question about corruption here what kind of a corruption is he talking about is it political corruption or actual monetary corruption that's another question so what happened is the the the, the entire mainstream media focused a lot on this special prince was Al-Walid bin Talal who has um shares in, in major companies like Twitter and so forth. But there is also Mithab bin Abdullah, who's, who's, he's, um, he's the head of the national uh, uh, security uh, uh, apparatus in the kingdom. Now, if we go back to what happened at the beginning of summer, summer 2017, when Mohammed bin Salman issued this coup against Mohammed bin Nayef, who was back then the crown prince, and he took his place, he also took control of the army and he took control of the police force inside of the kingdom, which means he became the leader and he became of both armies. And he also became the uh, uh, minister of defense and the minister of interior. And he's everything now. And he also became the crown prince. Now, if you go through what happened since uh, uh, the the um, ousting of uh, Mohammed bin Nayef, where all of these princes who are now detained were part of his party, they were loyal to Mohammed bin Nayef. So he, it was obvious that Mohammed bin Salman was just waiting for the right time, maybe, to get to them. And he did that investment uh, convention about uh, uh, Neom and the robot, etc. in the risk carton. He, he got them all in Saudi Arabia. He detained them two days later. An incredible series of events, to be sure. And depending on which narratives are to be believed or disbelieved, even more incredible than all of that, as... Osman goes on to state in that interview, she was relaying information that was being widely reported at the time about a fleeing helicopter being downed by Saudi war jets because uh, apparently the, one of the princes was attempting to escape this corruption drive sweep up and another prince that was supposedly killed while being arrested, but then the Saudis came out and said, no, he's not dead, don't worry. So a lot's just a chaotic series of events, breaking news uh, being reported here and there, and uh, sorting it all out is something of a difficulty, especially when the information coming out of the House of Saud is, of course, being carefully managed. So as I say, this is a breaking and developing news story that the narrative can shift from here, but at any rate, that's what we know or understand at this present time. But that still leaves us with the question of why? Why this? Why now? What suddenly just happened that made all of this region just explode? Well, as always, I have some answers for you, not the definitive answer that puts every piece into place, but at least some of the pieces of this puzzle, and I covered that in a uh, a editorial that I wrote for the International Forecaster from my subscriber newsletter this past weekend, Five Things You Need to Know About the Saudi Purge, that details such things as the fact that this entire purge was preceded just a week or so earlier by a trip by, guess who? Yes, Mr. Ivanka Trump, a.k.a. Arch-Zionist, a.k.a. Trump son-in-law, a.k.a. Jared Kushner, who up and went to Riyadh on a moment's notice without any... Uh, without any schedule. He wasn't scheduled to be there. It wasn't uh, announced by the White House. It was an unscheduled, unreported trip that wasn't uh, told to the press until afterward. He went there with National Security Advisor Dinah Powell and Middle East Envoy Jason Greenblatt. And we don't know exactly what that was about. It was intimated in the Israeli press that this was about a peace process. Jared Kushner is just up all night thinking and tossing and turning about the best way to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, so he up and went to Riyadh to meet with unnamed officials in the House of Saud. 
potentially MBS or potentially the other people in the House of Saud. At any rate, that's an interesting and crazy piece of this puzzle, but unfortunately, one of those things that unless we are in the back room, it's going to be difficult to sort out exactly what that was about. But there are other deeper and underlying issues that are being played out here, and this is where it starts to get into Game of Thrones territory, because of course, this is a global issue, and as I say, what's happening right now is of global importance, but in order to see that, first we have to start at the very local level where this is playing out and what is actually happening. And of course, this is the jockeying for position within Saudi Arabia itself, which is a fascinating and complicated story. But um, I guess the first thing we have to do is actually trace something of the family tree and what MBS's position is and how he came to this position of crown prince and head corruption drive sweeper upper. So MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, is the son of King Salman, technically King Salman bin Abdulaziz al Saud. And King Salman himself came to power when King Abdullah died on January 23rd, 2015. And I did write an editorial about the death of King Abdullah back at that time that I will direct you to and put in the show notes. Both uh, King Abdullah and King Salman were sons of Abdulaziz ibn Saud, the patriarch of the House of Saud, the founder of the modern Saudi Arabian state. So in April of that year, of 2015, King Salman upended tradition and appointed Mohammed bin Nayef as crown prince, marking the first time that one of the third generation of the House of Saud uh, was in line for the throne. Uh, traditionally, it should have been one of King Salman's brothers or half-brothers or however that quite works in the second generation, sons of King uh, uh, King Ibn Saud, um, the founder of the, the state. But he went with a third generation candidate, um, Mohammed bin Nayef. So that in and, of, in and of itself was upending of tradition. It was something different. And then in June of this year, Mohammed bin Nayef was swept aside in favor of King Salman's own son, Mohammed bin Salman. This 32-year-old upstart who is now not only crown prince, but first deputy prime minister of Saudi Arabia, president of the Council for Economic and Development Affairs, and the youngest defense minister in the world, which is partly why he is referred to in some New York Times pieces as Mr. Everything. Uh, he really does run the show pretty much in Saudi Arabia at this point um, for his 82-year-old aging and increasingly senile father. So, Mohammed bin Salman was just appointed head of a supreme committee to investigate public corruption on November 4th, and literally hours later, he's rounding up and locking up a number of his cousins at the Riyadh Ritz-Carlton, where they had just been gathered to announce Sophie the Robot as the newest citizen of Saudi Arabia and this $500 billion megacity in the desert. You got all that? Is that all straight in your head? No? Oh, well, too bad, because it's about to get much more complicated. So to understand, well, what, what is this Mohammed bin Nayef and then Mohammed bin Salman and changing the line of succession, what is this all about? We have to go and dig a little deeper. And we can do that from a series of articles that have been penned by Pepe Escobar, of course, frequent previous guest here on the Corbett Report. And he's posted some articles in the last few months that definitely explain and flesh out some of this with some caveats. And we'll go into that in a moment. But first, let's look at the first cookie crumb on this trail, uh, an article called House of Saudi Cards, the Inside Story that was posted up to Sputnik News on the 24th of June of this year, which reads in part, quote, Just when geopolitical practitioners were betting on regime change in Qatar, orchestrated by a desperate House of Saud, Regime change ended up happening in Riyadh, orchestrated by warrior prince, destroyer of Yemen, and blockader of Qatar, Mohammed bin Salman, MBS. Before the Riyadh coup, an insistent narrative had been pervading uh, selected Middle East geopolitical circles, according to which U.S. intel indirectly stopped another coup against the young emir of Qatar, Sheikh Tamim Al Thani, orchestrated by Mohammed bin Zayed, crown prince of Abu Dhabi, with help from Blackwater slash Academy's Eric Prince's Army of Mercenaries in the UAE. Zayed, crucially, happens to be MBS's mentor. Our source clarifies, 
The events are connected. Prince is CIA, but he probably step stopped any coup attempt on Qatar. The CIA blocked the coup in Qatar, and the Saudis reacted by dumping the CIA-selected Mohammed bin Nayef, who was to be the next king. The Saudis are scared. The monarchy is in trouble as the CIA moved the army in Saudi Arabia against the king. This was a defensive move by MBS. The source adds, MBS is failing everywhere. Yemen, Syria, Qatar, Iraq, etc. are all failures of MBS. China is also displeased with MBS as he has been stirring up trouble in Xinjiang. Russia cannot be happy that MBS was and is behind the lower oil price. Who are his allies? He has only one and that is his father, who is hardly competent. King Salman is virtually inca incapacitated by dementia. End quote. All right, so that's a piece from that June article, just after the line of succession was changed and Mohammed bin Nayef was taken out and Mohammed bin Salman put in. Well, according to this narrative, according to Pepe Escobar's source, an anonymous unverifiable source, so we have to take this information for what it is, but the source claims that Mohammed bin Nayef was Washington's golden boy, and he was taken out, Mohammed bin Salman put in, in line for the throne, as a kind of counter move against the U.S. blocking an attempt to overthrow the Emir of Qatar that was being undertaken by the UAE and Saudi Arabia. Are you following that? <laughs> well, if you need a little bit more on that, there was a uh, an, another article that was um, uh, followed up uh, that information in July of this year that was posted to Asia Times Online on July 20th. A coup in the House of Saud, which goes into this in greater detail about the blocking of the UAE slash Saudi attempt to overthrow the, the Emir of Qatar and the, how MBS was placed in as a, as a type of coup against the CIA golden boy of Mohammed bin Nayef. Um, well, of course, that ultimately culminates in the Night of the Long Knives that we've just seen. And once again, Pepe Escobar is here reporting on the inside story of the Saudi Night of the Long Knives, posted up to Asia Times Online on November 6th, 2017. And this article reads in part, quote, the House of Saud's King Salman devises a, a high-powered anti-corruption commission and appoints his son, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, a.k.a. MBS, as chairman. Right on cue, the commission detains 11 House of Saud princes, four current ministers, and dozens of former princes and cabinet secretaries, all charged with corruption. Hefty bank accounts are frozen, private jets are grounded, the high-profile accused lot is jailed at the Riyadh Ritz-Carlton. War breaks out within the House of Saud, as Asia Times had anticipated back in July. Rumors have been swirling for months about a coup against MBS in the making. Instead, what just happened is yet another MBS preemptive coup. A top Middle East business slash investment source who has been doing deals for decades with the opaque House of Saud offers some much needed perspective. This is more serious than it appears. The arrest of the two sons of pre previous King Abdullah, Princes Maitab and Turkey, was a fatal mistake. This now endangers the king himself. It was only the regard for the king that protected MBS. There are many left in the army against MBS, and they are enraged at the arrest of their commanders. To say the Saudi Arabian army is in an uproar is an understatement. He'd have to arrest the whole army before he could feel secure. All right, and moving further along in that article, quote, the story starts with secret deliberations in 2014 about a possible removal of then-King Abdullah. But the dissolution of the royal family would lead to the breaking apart of tribal loyalties and the country splitting into three parts. It would be more difficult to secure the oil, and the broken institutions, whatever they were, should be maintained to avoid chaos. Instead, a decision was reached to get rid of Prince Bandar bin Sultan, then actively coddling Salafi jihadis in Syria, and replace the control of the security apparatus with Mohammed bin Nayef. The succession of Abdullah proceeded smoothly. Power was shared between three main clans, King Salman and his beloved son, Prince ha Mohammed, the son of Prince Nayef, the other Prince Mohammed, and finally, the son of the dead king, Prince Maiteb, commander of the National Guard. In practice, Salman let MBS run the show. And, in practice, blunders also followed. The House of Saud lost its lethal regime change drive in Syria and is bogged down in an unwinnable war in Yemen, which, on top of it, prevents MBS from exploiting the empty quarter, 
the desert straddling both nations. Throughout these developments, aversion to MBS never ceased to grow. There are three major royal family groups aligning against the present rulers, the family of former King Abdullah, the family of former King Fahad, and the family of former Crown Prince Nayef. Nayef, who replaced Bandar, is close to Washington and extremely popular in Langley due to his counter-terrorism activities. His arrest earlier this year angered the CIA and quite a few factions of the House of Saad, as it was interpreted as MBS forcing his hand in the power struggle. According to the source, he might have gotten away with the arrest of CIA favorite Mohammed bin Nayef if he smoothed it over, but MBS has now crossed the Rubicon, though he's no Caesar. The CIA regards him as totally worthless. End quote. All right, well, I hope you managed to keep track of some of that, and I will, of course, exhort you to go to the show notes and please do look at the actual articles themselves, which flesh this out in greater detail. But I think the picture is starting to emerge of what has really happened here. In a sense, this was a counter-counter coup. If the coup was putting putting MBS in, in a line as the next as the next person in line for the throne, the crown prince, as a way of displacing or deposing Mohammed bin Nayef, who had been the Washington choice, the CIA golden boy, we won't overthrow King Abdul, we won't send Saudi Arabia into crisis as long as we have some sort of, oh, how about Mohammed bin Nayef? Well, they took him out, they put MBS in. This has caused some consternation, obviously, which was resulting in a reaction against MBS, and in reaction to that reaction, he preemptively rounded up a bunch of would-be potential counter-coup plotters and is basically uh, holding them ransom or holding them hostage uh, and sending the Saudi army into uproar against MBS himself. So there is every possibility that this ongoing event, which certainly does not end here, could continue forward in some sort of coup against MBS. And there are apparently enough people in the Saudi army who are enraged enough that that is a possibility. But then again, again, we have to take this with a grain of salt on the caveat that this is from an anonymous source close to the House of Saad. Take the information for what it's worth. But it does, it does paint an interesting picture of these events and one that certainly does leave a gigantic question mark over how this is going to be resolved, if such a word is even possible when it comes to these types of tectonic moves. Now, where does this actually leave us today? Well, on the bigger picture, looking outward from Saudi Arabia, this leads to this strange situation where Lebanon, well, Hezbollah has said that Saudi Arabia declared war on us, and then Saudi Arabia said, no, you guys have declared war on us. And of course, in the, mean, in the meantime, in the background, Saudi Arabia and Israel, who are now best buddies on this issue at any rate, are colluding over potential invasion of Lebanon. And further war, furthermore, of course, Lebanon is not just about Lebanon. It's not just about Hezbollah. It's about the Iran-Saudi Arabia proxy war, which Yemen is also about to a certain extent. And Israel is saying, well, don't worry, we'll help share intelligence on Iran with you guys for the coming war. It is getting crazy, and it's becoming a standoff with lots of different people on lots of different sides. The only bright spot that I see that potentially precludes any hot military activity as a direct result of this is that, as Pepe was pointing out there in those articles, MBS has been nothing but failures since coming into line as an important player in this new uh, iteration of the third generation of the House of Saud, and he has bungled Syria, and he has bungled Yemen from the Saudi perspective, of course. Uh, he's bungled it in the sense that it's a disaster, let alone a war crime of disastrous proportions going on in Yemen right now. But from a strategic point of view, nothing is going well. Saudi can Saudi Arabia can barely handle a conflict with Yemen, which is one of the poorest nations on the planet and highly destabilized anyway. How is it going to start something with Hezbollah in Lebanon and then potentially drawing in Iran? Uh, this is, I think, a step too far, which is why I think there may be some breaks on this situation. But having said that, it is uh, a lit fuse, so to speak, and it's by no means certain that that fuse won't uh, go all the way down to the bomb that is waiting underneath it, the geopolitical bomb. So a very hair-raising situation, and you wouldn't think there'd be much that would potentially be good from this, 
But uh, again, last week I was talking to Sharmin Narwani, uh, another analyst in Lebanon who has been looking for a number of years at the the bigger strategy that is taking place, the bigger power blocks that are forming in the Middle East region. And she has been noting that there is this quote-unquote resistance block that has been formed or is forming as a result of, essentially as a result of resistance to a Saudi, U.S., Israeli axis that has formed and has different members that have come and gone within that axis over the last few years. But uh, uh, resisting them is uh, Syria, of course, Uh, Iran, uh, Iraq, question mark, to a certain extent, is being pushed into that fold. And behind them, of course, China and Russia. So a very interesting situation is developing. And as Sharmin Narwani points out, what recent events in Syria and elsewhere in this region, and even the Saudi purge and the chaos going on in the House of Saud points to, is potentially a good thing overall in the long term for how this will play out in the region and in the world? I mean, there's some really amazing things happening right now, and uh, they could go in a lot of different directions. That's why I, I would like to finish up with the dreaded question. I'm going to ask you to break out your crystal ball and tell us, where is this all going? (laughs) Uh, I know you can't possibly answer that question, but what is the likely way in which these blocks are going to start butting heads, as it were? I can't answer the short-term and middle-term question, but sometimes those aren't even necessary, because even if there's a war, it will be a short one. You know, you need weapons to keep fueling up the war, um, and you need the international community to sit back and do nothing, which will not happen since Russia and China have become very active Security Council um, permanent members during the course of the Syrian conflict. So it's not just these shifts in in, in, um, power axes that have taken place in the Middle East, but it's a global one, you know. So where where I can't tell you if there will be a war in the short term or if this will die out um, just as, as inflammatory rhetoric. Um, I can tell you that <clears throat> the non-Saudi American UAE Israeli axis, okay, the other axis, the so-called resistance axis that includes Iran, Syria, Hezbollah slash Lebanon, now Hamas slash Gaza and Russia and potentially Iraq, um, keeps going from strength to strength. So if I was a betting person and looking at the range of things that have taken place in the Middle East over the last seven years, I would bet on this horse. I would bet on the resistance axis horse because um, they, they have, they share common goals. What you don't see on the U S axis side is common goals. And I'll tell you what's, um, what's very telling about this is every time in the Syrian theater, when, Uh, militants, anti-government militants stormed an area and occupied it. Um, Within a few days, they were shooting at each other because they were Qatari-backed, Turkish-backed, Saudi-backed, American-backed, CIA-backed, State Department-backed, and they all had their own agendas. And this is the problem with this axis. I mean, Trump is not on the same page as Tillerson. You know, you can't imagine the, the, the Saudis. I mean, there's a, a, a revolt within the, the ruling family. I mean, you cannot imagine there to be common vision. On the other hand, so I can't tell you if there will be a war, there will be bombings, what, in the short term in this region. In the long term, I see an extremely optimistic picture. And part of that is because of the entrance of, um, well, of Russia and China into the Middle East theater, China economically, Russia militarily, and with uh, bringing political clout on, in the international scene. Um, but, but with an American hyper-focus on containing Russian, Chinese, and Iranian power in the last few years. They've pushed these three countries together in an unusual alliance, loose alliance, which has become fortified over the last few years as these three players, three key players, have learned about each other and learned about common cause that they share. Um, And out of this, I think, will come a new political reality in the region. Um, These three countries, Russia, China, and Iran, share the same temperament. 
They share the same desire to ensure that international law is abided by and upholded, okay? Because when it is upheld, these three countries benefit, okay? Temperamentally, they are they are strategic minded and they are slow to move but sure to win. We've seen this over and over again, and they're coming in to now resolve, you know, with with this idea of a larger Asia, okay, um, sort of the Asian century economically developing. Let's not forget that much of the Middle East is West Asia, and when Arabs are reminded that they are Asian among their first three identities. We are going to see economy boom here. So I think there's a grand vision shared by major players and major hegemons in this region that will always outsmart whatever these sort of, um, you know, the, the, the little boys are doing to stir things up in the region. And there's a lot invested in that. Once again, Charmin Narwani of MideastShuffle.com. And just as a side note, for those who aren't following my interviews feed or aren't following the Corporate Report website on a regular basis, you should at least be subscribed to the Corporate Report Extras channel, where those interviews, Charmin Narwani, Marwa Osman, and many others are being posted on a regular basis so you can see those interviews in their entirety. But there you go. There is an example of a vision a mid to long term vision for how things are playing out that could potentially be somewhat hopeful if you squint your eye in the right way. And that is the broad outline of that vision. Again, you'll have to go to the full interview for more details on it. But the idea here being that this resistance block is having success after success in countering the the Saudi US Israel axis and their machinations in the region and the resistance bloc is actually united in a vision of development and cooperation and that's why they're winning. Um, it's a nice idea. Uh, as you might imagine, I have my reservations about that idea and that the fact the the resistance bloc are going to be saviors and are going to treat everyone wonderfully. Well, I, I have my reservations about that, but it is an interesting perspective, and it is certainly true that the resistance bloc is winning at this point. The momentum is on their side, so what is happening in Saudi Arabia may see, be seen as part of the deterioration of that uh, broader axis that they've been a part of, and which really has fallen apart, has dashed upon the shores of Syria, interestingly enough. So there is something to that. Um, unfortunately, in the short term, it still leaves us in a very chaotic situation with a Saudi Arabia, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, that is facing an existential crisis, really. Um, and the the coup, counter coup, counter counter coup, whatever it is that's happening right now, is just one form and one expression of that. So, in order to understand the deeper, deeper level of this. We have to understand that this is not a local Saudi issue per se. It is not even a regional conflict issue in the warfare sense. This is a global phenomenon. And in order to understand that, we have to, as always, follow the money. Or, as you will have known, as you will know having seen how and why Big Oil conquered the world, perhaps in this case, more appropriate to say, follow the oil. By the late 1960s, the nation relied on imported oil to keep the economy strong. Then, in the early 1970s, oil-dependent America's nightmares came true. Thirteen oil-producing countries in the Middle East and South America formed OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. In 1973, OPEC placed an oil embargo on the U.S. and other nations that had supported Israel against the Arab states in the Yom Kippur War. The American economy went into a tailspin as gas shortages gripped the nation. Few, however, know that the crisis and its ensuing response was in fact prepared months ahead of time at a secret meeting in Sweden in 1973. The meeting was the annual gathering of the Bilderberg Group, a secretive cabal formed by Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands in 1954. The Dutch royal family not only gave its royal imprint to Royal Dutch Petroleum, they are still rumored to be, along with the Rothschilds, 
one of the largest shareholders in Royal Dutch Shell. From the days when Queen Wilhelmina's Anglo-Dutch petroleum holdings and other investments made her the world's first female billionaire, right through to today. Bernhard's guest list at the Bilderberg Group reflected his position in the oligarchy. Alongside him at the Swedish conference were David Rockefeller of the Standard Oil Dynasty and his protege Henry Kissinger, Baron Edmund de Rothschild, E.G. Collado, the vice president of Exxon, Sir Dennis Greenhill, director of British Petroleum, and Garrett A. Wagner, president of Bernard's own Royal Dutch Shell. At the meeting in Sweden, held five months before the oil crisis began, the oligarchs and their political and business allies were planning their response to a monetary crisis that threatened the world dominance of the U.S. dollar. Under the Bretton Woods system, negotiated in the final days of World War II, the U.S. dollar would be the backbone of the world monetary system, convertible to gold at $35 per ounce, with all other currencies pegged to it. Increasing U.S. expenditures in Vietnam and decreasing exports caused Germany, France, and other nations to start demanding gold for their dollars. With the Federal Reserve's official gold holdings plunging and unable to stem the tide of demand, Nixon abandoned Bretton Woods in August 1971, threatening the dollar's position as the world reserve currency. Accordingly, I have directed the Secretary of the Treasury to take the action necessary to defend the dollar against the speculators. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. As leaked documents from the 1973 Bilderberg meeting show, the oligarchs decided to use their control over the flow of oil to save the American hegemon. Acknowledging that OPEC could completely disorganize and undermine the world monetary system, the Bilderberg attendees prepared for an energy crisis or an increase in energy costs, which, they predicted, could mean an oil price between $10 and $12, a staggering 400% increase from the current price of $3.01 per barrel. Five months later, Bilderberg attendee and Rockefeller protege Henry Kissinger, acting as Nixon's Secretary of State, engineered the Yom Kippur War and provoked OPEC's response, an oil embargo of the U.S. and other nations that had supported Israel. On October 16, 1973, OPEC raised oil prices by 70%. At their December meeting, the Shah of Iran demanded and received a further raise to $11.65 a barrel, or 400% of oil's pre-crisis price. When asked by Saudi King Faisal's personal emissary why he had demanded such a bold price increase, he replied, Tell your king, if he wants the answer to this question, he should go to Washington and ask Henry Kissinger. In the second move of the operation, Kissinger helped negotiate a deal with Saudi Arabia. In exchange for U.S. arms and military protection, the Saudis would price all their future oil sales in dollars and recycle those dollars through treasury purchases via Wall Street banks. The deal was a bonanza for the oligarchs. Not only did they get to pass the price increases on to the consumers, but they benefited from the huge flows of money into their own banks. The Shah of Iran parked the National Iranian Oil Company's revenues in Rockefeller's own Chase Bank, revenues that reached $14 billion per year in the wake of the oil crisis. With the creation of this new system, the petrodollar, the oligarchs had reached unprecedented levels of control over the economy. Not only that, they had backed the world monetary system with their commodity, oil, and brought potential competition from upstart producer nations under their control all in one step. Ah, uh, yes, the petrodollar. Now, of course, if you've been following the corporate report, you will know about the petrodollar because I have spoken about it before, both its development and its near-term future, um, which looks increasingly bleak for proponents of the petrodollar. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, please do at least search the term petrodollar on the corporate report website or you can go specifically to a, a video that I did last year on why is the MSM reporting on the petrodollar now, uh, where I talked about the development of this system, some of the sources that you can use to find out more specific details about this. There was an interesting report, as I say, that came out from Bloomberg last year that was talking about the secret de de deal that uh, Saudi Arabia had made to purchase U.S. treasuries with their petrodollars that was 
officially a secret until last year. Everyone knew about it, but at any rate, it's finally been revealed. Uh, some interesting things going on in the petrodollar space in recent years, and uh, this House of Sod Game of Thrones has to be seen in light of that, in the fact that this, what's happening in Saudi Arabia isn't just about Saudi Arabia, it is about the backbone of the monet world monetary system itself. I don't care if you're sitting here in Japan or if you're sitting in Canada or the United States or Europe or South Africa or South America, anywhere on the globe, you are affected one way or another by what is happening to the petrodollar right now. And again, Saudi Arabia is, is ground zero for this tectonic shake that's happening. And uh, we have to understand, of course, the oil kingdom, Saudi Arabia, is founded and funded and based on oil. Oil revenue is the lifeblood of Saudi Arabia and is, in a sense, why the House of Saud exists or has power, is able to maintain its power. Uh, Saudi Arabia is a tribal a nation that would be breaking apart into at least th three separate pieces if it weren't for the consolidation of control that is enabled by the free flow of oil money, which allows things like 0% income tax and, uh, and laugh lavish social welfare programs and the fact that, you know, the Saudis don't have to work so much. It's more the foreigners that they bring in to do the actual labor in the economy. Um, those sorts of things have been enabled by the for steady and seemingly limitless flow of oil money into the kingdom. But all of that has changed in recent years. You'll remember back in 2014, we had the oil price plunge and we've had the glut, which has kept oil prices much down further below um, what they had been in recent years. And that has taken a toll, taken a toll most interestingly on a lot of the uh, the countries that are in this the crosshairs of the State Department, like Russia and Venezuela and others uh, have certainly suffered quite a bit by this oil price plunge. But interestingly enough, Saudi Arabia, who it is presumed has was the one, at least one of the parties precipitating this event, are themselves suffering from this oil price plunge. And we ha can see that. We can chart its development. This was part of my five things you need to know about the Saudi uh, purge article where I talked about this existential crisis, and you can see it just from the headlines following over the last couple of years. First, you get weak oil prices squeezing Saudi Arabia's coffers. Then Saudi plans spending cuts, reforms to shrink budget deficit. Saudi Arabia seeks six to eight billion dollar bank loan to shore up state coffers. Oil price swings spark cigarette taxes in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia to increase domestic petrol prices by 80%. Rising gas prices, cigarette taxes, the government taking out loans. In any other country, this would be uh, just another day. What, you know, what's the big news? In Saudi Arabia, that is a sign of a very big shift that's taking place because Saudi Arabia is depleting its reserves madly, trying to keep up with its, uh, with its obligations in the light of declining oil revenues. Now, interestingly enough, because of this purge and chaos and whatever is going on in the Gulf right now, oil prices are going back up uh, slightly right now. So in a way, maybe they're helping their own situation by causing chaos within their own kingdom. But at any rate, uh, the, the longer term problem still remains as Saudi Arabia starts casting about. And added to that is the fact that they're, they're their number one partner, their 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 oil uh, dependent um, partner that really needs the, to to purchase their oil and and is there a partner in the alliance which is the backbone of the world monetary system? The United States doesn't quite need them as much anymore now that we have the shale boom underway and the U.S. is uh, cutting down on oil imports and is in fact uh, starting to export uh, oil uh, petroleum products. Uh, there's a definite shift taking place in Saudi Arabia's customer base for its oil. And so now we have the situation where Saudi Arabia is desperate for money and is losing one of its main customers for its oil. If only there was some nation that they could hold hands with and come to some sort of other alliance with. 
China and Saudi Arabia have agreed to lift their bilateral ties to a comprehensive strategic partnership and have called for more industrial capacity cooperation. The announcement was made after Saudi King Salman bin Abdulaziz Al Saud held talks with visiting Chinese President Xi Jinping. President Xi arrived in Riyadh on Tuesday on the first stop of his three-nation tour of the Middle East. It's the first state visit by a Chinese head of state to Saudi Arabia in seven years. During that meeting, the two leaders agreed to build a stable long-term energy cooperation and make the China-initiated Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank a win-win financing platform. Saudi King Salman began a visit to Beijing on Thursday that highlights growing ties between the two nations. Officials from both countries on Thursday signed 14 agreements involving a variety of sectors including trade, energy, education and technology. The cooperation deals are potentially worth about 65 billion US dollars. A memo of understanding with state-run Norinco will study build refining and chemical projects in China. President Xi says the launch of the refinery not only conforms to the Saudi National Development Strategy, or con uh, but uh, also to China's Belt and Road Initiative. The jointly funded refinery covers over 5 million square meters in the industrial city of Yanbu. That's on the west coast of Saudi Arabia. It is one of China's largest investment projects in the country and the entire region as well. And along comes China, the new rising power with its insatiable thirst for oil, doing things like opening up oil refineries in Saudi Arabia and cooperating, signing billions of dollars worth of deals, doing bilateral trade and uh, state visits, uh, Xi to Riyadh and Salman to Beijing. It's an interesting, developing, burgeoning, flowering relationship that people who have been keeping their eyes on the international situation in the last few years have seen coming. This is not this is not exactly a surprise if you've been following this. It is a developing relationship. And it gets even deeper. Because, as I was reporting in my very recent report on the Chinese New World Order that's coming into view with the Petro Yuan. Yes, it turns out that, as revealed in a Reuters report from last month, during this time of crisis in the House of Saud, and during the time where MBS's Vision 2030 for the future of Saudi Arabia dictates that Saudi Aramco will sell off a 5% stake in the company as an IPO, floating it uh, publicly on the, on the markets, uh, in next year is the deadline for that um, that's been set for several years now. Well, guess what? Along comes China to say, no, 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 you don't want to list uh, Aramco publicly. We'll just buy that stake directly. So that's the offer on the table, according to these reports. And what exactly the offer is and how seriously it's being considered remains to be seen. But at any rate, it is an offer on the table. And that, again, is huge. If China becomes an actual stakeholder in Saudi Aramco, what do you think that will do to the U.S.-Saudi relationship that is the backbone of the petrodollar that itself is the backbone of the world monetary system? It's almost as if China is getting in there to try to destabilize or at any rate take over a slice of that petrodollar pie. But I don't get it. Oil is always denominated in dollars, right? So any oil trade between Saudi and China ultimately is just backing up the petrodollar anyway, isn't it? China is the world's second largest oil consumer. In 2016, the country imported 381 million tons of crude oil. Currently, international oil prices are set by benchmarks such as the Brent in the UK and the WTI in the USA. That could change when China launches its own crude oil futures. So having a third alternative benchmark uh, will certainly increase the liquidity of oil futures market as well as the efficiency of oil pricing. Chinese investors have been waiting for the crude futures for quite some time, but its launch was delayed in 2015 due to major market turmoil that year. Experts say the time to roll out crude oil futures is ripe in 2017, as domestic capital markets have matured over the past years thanks to reforms. Uh, in the past two years, 
China has launched several reforms in terms of allowing non-state-owned enterprises to participate in the import of crude oil. So now we have uh, more players in the physical oil uh, sector, which can certainly improve the liquidity of oil futures market. Welcome to the world of the Petro Yuan. Yes, it's coming into view. It is at least feasible now that we have this futures, crude oil futures market that is being denominated in Yuan. And add that to the Shanghai Gold Exchange that opened last year, whereby you can trade Yuan for gold. So the possibility of oil sales that are denominated in Yuan ultimately being transacted and transferred into gold, which of course, as we know, China has been stockpiling galore over the last several years. Well, they may be attempting to create an alternative to the petrodollar. Essentially, oil for gold swaps with China or with Russia or with other trading nations that are uh, willing to sell their oil to China. And suddenly, the petrodollar system looks a bit antiquated doesn't it? What is really backing up that petrodollar system other than the barrel of the gun? Well, that is the issue. And this all ties right back to what I was talking about in Denmark. Echoes of World War I, China, the US, and the next great war. Uh, it's hard to avoid these subjects these days because it keeps circling back around. It's almost as if this is the actual narrative. This is the real story. And all these other things are parts and pieces of that puzzle. And this Saudi purge has to be seen in this light. One of the parts, one of the pieces of what's going on here is this monetary warfare that's taking place low-key behind the scenes. Now, I'm not saying this is the total everything, this is the only piece, this is, this is everything we need to know about the Saudi purge. No, there are many, many, many things, many factors that are happening here, and there's much more that needs to be explored about, for example, Pepe Escobar's reporting on the, the CIA involvement uh, to block the UAE-Saudi overthrow of the Qatari Emir, and, and MBS as a kind of uh, counter move against that, and all of that sort of stuff. And then, of course, with the regional conflicts and then the resistance block, all of these are stories in and of themselves and deserve much more attention. But I'm saying that one of the key and underlocking, underlying pieces of this entire puzzle is the monetary system, which is going through a period of transition. The only question is, what will emerge on the other side or how will this transition be blocked? Now that is really an interesting story going forward. So of course I'll have my eyes on that. And of course I will be continuing to cover what is going on in the region in and of itself uh, in the coming weeks and months as well as I don't know in what way this Saudi purge is going to shake out, but I know that this is only the beginning of this story for the House of Saud and for the rest of the world. I hope you will join me in this quest to continue reporting on this. As always, it's an open source investigation, so I wholeheartedly invite Corbett Report members to log in and keep putting these important pieces of the puzzle as they come up in the comment thread. Let's exchange the information so we can learn our way forward from here. There's much more that deserves to be said, and I'm looking forward to hearing it from all of you. On that note, we're going to leave this topic here for today, but obviously much more to say on it in the future. I'm your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, thanking you for joining me for another edition of The Corbett Report. Available now from CorbettReport.com. Oil. The 19th century was transformed by it. The 20th century was shaped by it. And the 21st century is moving beyond it. But who gave birth to the oil industry? And what are they planning to do with that power in a post-carbon world? Heirs to an oil fortune join the divestment drive. There is a price to carbon in their future. The negative impact of population growth. That is important not only for the planet, it is important for the business. What do you see as the biggest challenges in, in conservation? Yeah, the, the growing human population. How and why Big Oil Conquered the World. Watch the documentary for free or purchase a DVD copy at CorbettReport.com slash Big Oil.